Undeniable, Part 8. We've been going through the book Undeniable by Douglas Axe. The full title is How Biology Confirms Our Intuition That Life is Designed. It's written, uh, it's published by HarperCollins Publishers in New York in this year. So this is relatively uh, modern. There's the uh, cover of the book. Um, I've compressed his summation of the book a little bit. Um, where you see yellow, that's where I have uh, added or omitted words. But it's largely his, uh, uh, his wording, or at least wording that he approves. Douglas Axe urges that the key to understanding our origins is the design intuition, the innate belief held by all humans. The tasks we would need knowledge to accomplish can only be accomplished by someone who has that knowledge. For the ingenious task of inventing life, this knower can only be God. There is science that proves our design intuition is valid. Everyday experience can empower ordinary people to defend their design intuition. Living creatures are brilliantly conceived, utterly beyond the reach of accident. Now, I'm going to quote from chapter 1 because in chapter 1 he lays out how the other chapters are going to be and we're going to be talking about chapter 12. So the following two chapters, 11 and 12, will serve as a reality check, first by considering carefully whether we have overlooked anything in rejecting the evolutionary explanation of life, and then, and this is where we'll be concentrating, asking whether the scientific community's defense of evolution looks more like a science thing or a culture thing. Chapter 12, Last Throws. Having hopefully persuaded you along our journey that our design intuition has triumphed over the evolutionary story, I now want to enlist your help. The truth we've arrived at is important enough that we have a responsibility to stand up for it. Think of this as a movement, not a battle. When a good movement prevails, everyone wins. And notice he's trying to be inclusive, and I think that's a good thing. Still, movements involve strategy just as battles do, and momentum is a key part of this. One way for a movement to gain momentum is for those who join the cause to see opponents of that cause in retreat. Unlike battles, the hope here is that hands will reach out to those in retreat to encourage them to change their allegiance. To that end, this chapter will focus on multiple fronts where the defenders of materialism and Darwinism seem to be in retreat. Well, you wouldn't get that from the uh, media, would you? Darwin's explanation of life turns out to have been wrong, but in that, it joins a great many other di ideas that have had their useful places in the development of scientific understanding. Originally, at least, Darwin's idea was articulated with enough clarity to ensure that it would ultimately prove true or false. Moreover, Darwin clearly identified the crucial point on which this verdict hung. In his words, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. That is, if any of the inventions we see in the living world can't be acquired one tiny beneficial mutation at a time. Darwin's hopes for natural selection were in vain. His next words, but I can find out no such case, revealed where his sympathies lay, which only confirms he was human. Somewhere within the long succession of his followers, all bright people coaxed into abandoning their design intuition. He's saying that because previously he cited evolutionists who studied and found out that kids, until they have been transformed, naturally believe in design and naturally believe in de divine design. Even kids raised by atheist parents. Uh, in, uh, all bright people coaxed into abandoning their design intuition. 
Darwin's recognition that his idea of gradual invention was vulnerable to refutation was lost. In general terms, the human factors that put an end to vulnerability are very familiar. The idea of natural selection became, to biologists, part of the very definition of life. And with this elevated status came immunity from criticism. To question the most central axiom of modern biology was, and is, to excuse oneself from the company of modern biologists. The familiar truth is that on matters we care about, we admit the possibility of being wrong only with some reluctance. More as a way of showing ourselves to be reasonable than as a way of encouraging criticism. And that's true of all of us, not just Darwinists. If and when that concession seems unnecessary, we're inclined to withdraw it. Then, with the passage of time, we become so comfortable with the absence of open criticism that we're indignant when someone unaware of the ground rules violates them. The natural progression, in other words, is from reluctant acceptance of criticism in principle to resentment of, criti of criticism in practice. As human as this progression is, it's distinctly hypocritical when it takes hold in a community that bases itself on reason and open discourse. Faith communities, being explicit in their commitment to doctrine, are being true to their core values when they correct or remove people who oppose what they once agreed to uphold. Although uh, I would argue that uh, the best theology is that has that kind of openness. Uh, but, as, but for the scientific community to do likewise, based as it is on discovery instead of doctrine, is to violate its core principles. The consequences are always ugly. Lacking any special revelation, science boasts intellectual openness as its core virtue. And what a potent virtue this is proved to be, and I think it can prove to be so in theology as well. But when openness gives way to dogma on any particular scientific claim, we're left with something more like bad religion than good science. To spot one of those ugly examples, look for two telltale signs. The first is official denouncement of any idea that opposes a threat to the dogma. And the second is a culture of disdain for that threatening idea. On the first point, take a look at Wikipedia page entitled list of scientific bodies explicitly rejecting intelligent design, where you'll find names of over a dozen academic and scholarly organizations in the United States that have issued statements opposing ID, along with several others outside the uni United States or of international composition. And uh, among other examples, the Royal Society of London and the National Academy of Sciences of the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. These uh, being scientific organizations, they don't want to appear to have rejected ID on doctrinal grounds, so their denouncements uh, assert that ID can't be given a place at the table of scientific discourse because it's fundamentally religious. Ironically, though, their anti-ID activism has a quasi-religious character of its own. If they actually believe the question of whether life is intelligently designed to be outside the purview of science, they would take no position on the answer. But they do take a position. The Royal Society of London has officially declared that, quote, the theory of evolution is supported by the weight of scientific evidence. The theory of intelligent design is not, end quote. Likewise, the world's largest scientific society, the American Chemical Society, has urged educational authorities to affirm evolution as the only scientifically accepted explanation for the origin and diversity of species. And the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada is unequivocal in its support of contemporary evolutionary theory that has its roots in the seminal work of Charles Darwin and has been refined by findings accumulated over 140 years. Nowhere under that proud Darwinian flag that flies over the modern academy, will you find an institutional declaration to this effect, although life may well, or even life may, be the work of an intelligent designer, this is not a matter that science can address. That can only mean one thing, the anti-ID activism comes down to a doctrinal stance after all. That the hoisting of the materialistic Darwinian flag also ushers in a culture of disdain for threatening ideas like ID becomes evident when you look a little deeper than the position statements. 
Intelligent design is mentioned frequently in Darwinian science journals, but always negatively and often with some expression of condescension or contempt. Within these otherwise scholarly pages, you'll find intelligent descri design described, apparently with editorial approval, and I might add peer review approval, as a myth, as an attack on biology, as an intellectual virus, as an insidious movement, as the pseudo-scientific face of religious creationism, as something that threatens all of science and society, as a retreat to the dark ages, and finally, space not permitting a full catalog of anti-ID epithets, as terrifying, like Frankenstein's monster. Hmm. Despite the complete rationality of the case for the intelligent design of life, there's just no way to make that conclusion acceptable to people who want to believe science has disproved God, including, I might add, some many non-scientists. The truth is quite the opposite, which is distinctly uncomfortable for some. Perhaps this explains why some people react so viscerally. Not that ID is legitimate, but just the opposite. It's painfully legitimate. Now he's going to uh, note two, three other, two other things, I think. They retreat from Darwinism and eventually retreat from the universe. As telling as the retreat from critical dialogue is, there are several other equally sure indicators that the search for a natural explanation of living things has come up empty. Perhaps the most striking of these is the repeated acknowledgement from scientists closest to the subject that Darwin didn't actually achieve such an explanation. Contrary to what you may have been told in the popular press. This is the gaping hole we encountered in Chapter 7. In his 1904 book, Species and Varieties, Their Origin and Mutation, the great Dutch botanist Hugo de Vries stated the deficiency as follows. Now remember, they know this. They allowed him to publish this in a peer-reviewed article. In indicating the particular means by which the change of species has been brought about, Darwin had, has not succeeded in securing universal acceptation. Quite the contrary. Objections have been raised from the very outset and with such force as to compel Darwin himself to change his views in his later writings. Whoa. This, however, was to no avail and objections and criticisms have since steadily accumulated. That doesn't sound like sweeping everything before, does it? So the sudden favorable turn of scientific opinion Darwin described in the sixth edition of his book, which we viewed earlier, where biologists went from believing in the separate creation of each species to acceptance of his great principle of evolution wasn't accompanied by general acceptance of natural selection as the cause. Accordingly, de Vries ended his book with a memorable quote describing what we are calling the gaping hole. Natural selection may explain the survival of the fittest, but it do, cannot explain the arrival of the fittest. Now, this is a guy who approves of the general idea of the project, just as Darwin hasn't actually completed the job. Santa Fe Institute scientist Walter Fontana and Yale biologist uh, Leo Buss in 1994, repeating de Vries' memorable quote 90 years later, the arrival of the fittest toward a theory of biological organization. So, you know, they recognize the key importance of that quote. It begins with a big concession. The formal structure of evolutionary theory is based on the dynamics of alleles, that is gene variants, individuals, and populations. As such, the theory must assume the prior existence of these entities, that is, alleles, individuals, and populations. Don't miss the significance of this, because all living things, populations, are among these entities, 
Fontana and Buss are admitting here that modern evolutionary theory doesn't actually explain the origin of new species or even the origin of new genes. Instead, present theory tacitly assumes the prior existence of the entities whose features it is meant to explain. If you're wondering why some scientists get away with such startling frankness while others are censured or excommunicated, it all comes down to whether the critic is seen as a friend of the greater cause. Scientists can say what they want about the state of evolutionary theory if their allegiance to scientific materialism is intact. And the best way for them to demonstrate that is to claim to have filled the hole or at least made decisive prog uh, progress in that direction. You know, this used to be a problem with evolution, but now we can explain it. You can write stuff like that. And then you can be brutal to the old theory, as long as you have a new one. As with road repair, you're allowed to use a jackhammer with impunity as long as you punch, uh, patch everything up before you leave. Using that strategy, Fontana and Buss offered their deep criticism as a way of introducing a theory that, by their account, explains how self-maintaining organizations arise as a genetic, generic consequence of two features of chemistry without appeal to natural selection. In other words, Darwin was wrong, but life still is the expected outcome of blind chemistry, so all is well under the materialist flag. Like those two scientists, a great many others have tried to patch the hole in Darwin's theory over the years, but none of these patches have proved very durable. And they give an example. 20 years later, that is after Buss and uh, uh, Fontana, came a book by Swiss evolutionary biologist Andreas Wagner. So if the patch offered by Fontana and Buss were sound, Wagner would have been in a good position to affirm this. Instead, he reaffirmed the existence of the gaping hole as evidenced in his title, Arrival of the Fittest, Solving Evolution's Greatest Puzzle. Echoing his predecessors, Wagner conceded that natural selection can preserve innovations, but it cannot create them. After this, he says... To appreciate the magnitude of this problem, consider that every one of the differences between humans and the first life forms on Earth was once an innovation, an adaptive solution to some unique challenge faced by a living being. What Wagner calls innovations, I'd call, I've called inventions. But the point is the same, and it applies as much to spiders and whales and orchids as it does to humans. Of the countless remarkable innovations on display in the countless remarkable forms of life, Natural selection explains none of them. Wagner gets away with this devastating critique of Darwinism the same way Fontana and Buss did, by offering his idea of a solution. Being familiar with the subject he de deals with, I could tell you why I, didn't, I think he didn't succeed, but in fact I would be asking you to trust me over him, which none of us should find satisfactory. Instead, my whole purpose has been to equip you to trust your own design intuition. Wagner ends his book with this sum summation of his thesis. With a limited number of building blocks connected in a limited number of ways, you can create an entire world. Out of such building blocks and standard links between them, Nature has created a world of proteins, regulation circuits, and metabolisms that sustains life, has, that has brought forth the simple virus to, and complex humans and ultimately our culture and technology from the Iliad to the iPad. Um, nature is quite a creator. And uh, skipping a little bit, Wagner's second sentence, where the actor is nature, sounds like a fairy tale to everyone whose design intuition is intact. And again, unless we've gone very wrong in our thinking, it should sound like a fairy tale. Alphabet soup is chock full of building blocks, but nature is so clearly incapable of doing what we would with building blocks that we knew immediately the account of oracle soup. For those of you who weren't here earlier, that's you boil the soup and it, and it arranges alphabetical text in uh, 
ways that help you solve problems that you have. And nobody believes that, you know? Um, we knew immediately the count of oracle soup couldn't be true. As we realized back in chapter two, an irrefutable demonstration of that mysterious soup would only convince us that an invisible someone is arranging the letters. It just doesn't happen by itself. The mere tale of or oracle soup, however, sends no shivers down our spines for the simple reason that we have no reason to regard it as true. Because the arguments and evidence run counter to Darwin's idea, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised to see defenders of that idea shrinking back from the scientific discourse. Figure 12.1 illustrates their predicament. And here's figure 12.1. If accidental ca causes can't evolve one s protein from a very similar protein, that only takes about seven amino acids change to get from one protein to the other. In a, in a bacterium, how in the world are they going to invent people, foxes, salmon, orcas, dragonflies, or plants starting from that bacterium? Imagine a group of people insisting that a certain man can jump to the moon. We, being skeptical, challenge this man to dunk a basketball. And we find that he comes well short of reaching the rim. When we publish our finding, we get lots of complaints, all of the kind, we never said he could dunk a basketball, or at least not that basketball on that rim. But he can jump to the moon. If nothing can evolve its way into existence, then nothing did. The claim that evolution did invent proteins, cell types, organs, and life forms is scientifically legitimate only if we know evolution can invent these things. When that previous statement is no longer presumed true, we know we've reached the final stop in a staged retreat from testability. As I mentioned near the end of chapter six, this is where the debate now stands. Those of you who are there may remember that was where somebody said, well, these gene regulatory networks, they can't evolve now, but once upon a time they could, and they've evolved so well that now they can't evolve any further, or can't re-evolve. I got to your backyard by jumping over the stepping stones uh, through the chasm. Where are the stepping stones? Oh, they're gone now. Yeah, right. To put it bluntly, evolutionary theory has become immune to refutation in much the same way that the stump of a tree has become immune to further pruning. There's nothing left. Strangely, after all the anti-science insults that have been directed at proponents of intelligent design, we seem to be among the few who are interested in using science to settle the matter. And a little background, and we'll go uh, into some of what, uh, some of the work that Douglas Axe has done in, in terms of finding out exactly how far evolution can go. He's been using science. This is not just, uh, it's not just words, he can back that up. The retreat from the universe. In 2007, in a paper that we've discussed in Sabbath School class before, and if you didn't see it, you can look it up on our website, um, Eugene Koonin, a prominent evolutionary biologist at the National Center for Biotechnology Information in Maryland, gave scientists in his field a double shock. The first shock was his frank concession that the origin of the first cell carrying genetic instructions for making proteins is, quote, a puzzle that defeats conventional evolutionary thinking, end quote. So you want to see what unconventional evolutionary thinking looks like? 
Having deployed this jackhammer, he was obliged to fill the resulting hole, which he attempted to do in a most unconventional way. Kunin delivered his second shock by appealing to cosmology, the study of the origin and behavior of the universe as a whole, to patch everything up. Specifically, to dispense with the problem of fantastic improbability, he leveraged the idea of an infinite multiverse, which we may think of as an infinite set of actual universes, ours being one. Understandably, most people consider this supposed multiverse to be so far removed from the real experience that they have a hard time taking it seriously. But while that skeptical stance should inform the discussion of where the boundaries of science lie, truth is a bigger and more profound subject than science. Just because it's not science doesn't mean it's not true. For my part, although I reject the existence of other universes, I'm not content to do so simply on the grounds that we can't verify their existence. Because it seems equally true that we can't verify their non-existence. The better question is whether the hypothetical possibility of an infinite multiverse should change the way we explain life in this universe. Kunin's reason for thinking it should be is based on a concept called the anthropic principle. Autobiographies of the I live to tell the tale kind show how this principle works. In these books, the author recounts circumstances where death seemed virtually certain. And yet, the very fact that he or she lived to tell the tale assures us that the odds of surviving, however slim, were somehow overcome. To follow the reasoning here, start by supposing that the probability of a universe producing intelligent beings like us by accident is greater than zero. We'll return to this later. Using gazillion as a placeholder for some very, very large number, we'll say this probability amounts to one in a gazillion. It follows then that for every gazillion universes, one is expected to have intelligent beings who came about by accident. And because an infinite collection of universes has an infinite number of gazillions within it, it follows that there should be an infinite number of these very special one in a gazillion universes that are home to thinkers like us, not by the hand of God, but by the raw power of infinitude. But what seems at first glance to be at least a provisional theoretical possibility doesn't square with reality. Why, how do you tack that kind of, okay? To see this, ask yourself what we should see in our universe if things really were as we have supposed. The answer is that we, as beings who wonder about our origins, should see the most bare bones circumstances for wondering to be possible. As with the search space we described in chapter 8, this hypothetical multiverse would consist almost entirely of uninteresting alternatives. These would be normal universes where the fantastically impro fantastic improbability of accidental invention equates to physical impossibility, so no invention occurs. And of course, we wouldn't be in those universes. But if we assume first that it's not categorically impossible for physical processes to produce beings capable of wonder, and second, that the infinite multiverse is real, then our present act of wondering could be explained by our universe being one of those fantastically rare universes where the staggering improbability of wanderers being invented by accident just happened to be overcome. Like the autobiography, our existence would be the proof. Now, here's where evolution comes in. If it were true that evolution works as a brilliant inventor and that intelligent beings like us are among the things it can invent, then I would agree with Kunin. The most bare bones explanation for us would be that simple cellular life was formed against all odds and evolution took over from there. So Kunin's appeal to a multiverse as a way of explaining how the fantastic improbability of that first cell was overcome is perfectly consistent with his set of assumptions. However, once we realize how incompetent evolution is as an inventor, this whole multiverse explanation collapses. We do indeed find ourselves in a world where individuals of one species, ours, wonder how everything came to be. But a big part of our wonder has to do with the obvious fact that this is anything but a bare bones world. Quite the opposite. You think about Darwin and the peacock. 
And she used to make him sick. Why? Because peacocks don't have to be that beautiful. The argument from beauty is one of the more powerful arguments for there being a God instead of a multiverse. Why should there be beauty? There's no utility in it. In fact, the peahens don't care about the male displays. That's been shown scientifically. So since every one of the biological inventions that surround us is fantastically improbable, with evolution explaining none, and the multiverse hypothesis explaining only those absolutely necessary for wondering to be possible, we conclude that this hypothesis fails to explain what we see. Conceivably, we could have found ourselves wandering on an austere planet populated by little more than lonely thinkers whose bodies are capable only of those functions absolutely necessary for thought. And because that kind of planet is vastly less improbable than this sumptuously appointed five-star accommodation we call Earth, well, even with sin, it's still four-star, we certainly would have found ourselves there rather than here if we really were accidents of nature. That we are here instead in these accommodations assures us that we are not. The elephant in the room. Because reality can't ultimately be grounded in physical things, materialism always fails when we ask big questions of it. This categorical inadequacy of the physical realm makes the number of physical universes irrelevant. Physical processes simply can't be the basis of everything, no matter how much room we give those processes to work. A similar principle holds for our understanding of reality. Contrary to the claim of scientism, we can't ultimately base our knowledge of truth in science. To see this, let's momentarily adopt a mind step, mindset of an absolute skeptic, someone who doubts everything that can be doubted. No one really is an absolute skeptic, and most of us never go to the trouble of even contemplating absolute skepticism. It will be worth doing for a moment, though, just to see how hopeless it would be to make skepticism our top priority. Think with me for a minute in the first person. How do I know I existed one minute ago? Is it enough for me to say I remember the past and see evidences of my past? Usually this is enough. Of course, at the end of a workday, I always find a familiar car in the spot where I recall parking my car, and this seems to confirm my recollection. While operating in absolute skeptic mode, however, I have to admit that these ties to my past are nothing more than present impressions. And I can't convince myself that my present impressions are infallible. I believe them, but I also find myself revisiting those, these beliefs quite regularly, as when waking from a dream, for example. So how do I know this whole life experience isn't a dream that just popped up into existence a moment ago? Again, I find that I'm content to believe otherwise, which is a very good thing, considering I can do no better. Neither can you. We must take some essential things on faith because there really is no alternative. My point is not that anyone is or ought to be an absolute skeptic. Rather, my point is that faith alone is what rescues us from the futility of absolute skepticism. If you think science can come to the rescue instead, ask yourself what confidence you can place in science without presupposing that you did exist a minute ago. If your entire past is an illusion, how can this thing you call science not also be an illusion? The truth is that science can't even conceivably give us anything more certain than the faith we place in the essential propositions undergirding science, which means science will never be the primary path to knowing, much less the only path to knowing. Faith has always been more fundamental to human knowledge than science, and this will never be change. What makes science so compelling is that we all do accept the essential propositions. And when we add nothing to these essentials, common science and common sense naturally lead us to attribute life to God, even as the children of atheists do. I can vaguely imagine a version of reality where God existed, but science and reason are silent about his existence. The conceivability of that imaginary world makes it all the more striking that this world is so different. Here, 
the silence is broken. Where it all lands. There's no way around the fact that everything resembling earthly life re requires high-level functional coherence. Nor is there any way around the fact that this makes the sum total of all possible things that would be recognized as earthly life impossibly rare. In the language of chapter 8, these possible life forms are hopelessly lost in the nearly infinite space representing the ways matter could be mindlessly arranged. What the inventor can do, seeing possibilities that are otherwise not there and seizing opportunities that only exist because they are imagined, cannot be done by accident. Yes, Darwin's idea falls when we grasp this, but so does every attempt to pretend that life just happened, no matter how sophisticated it may sound. If we try to avoid God by supposing all the necessary elements for each evolutionary step just happen to be at the right place, at the right time, against all odds, then we only push his creative work back from the creatures themselves to the circumstances that brought them about. If we try to avoid God by supposing life came to Earth from outer space, we only push his actions to another planet or another galaxy. If we try to avoid him by supposing life unfolded from the initial conditions of the universe or the laws of physics or some combination thereof, we make these things so ingeniously life-directed that we have only pushed his actions back in time. And by the way, we can't demonstrate that it w actually works all the time. And if we try to avoid him by imagining our universe is only one among an infinite number of universes, he shows himself to be present here nonetheless. That he has acted is plain to see, and no theory can erase what we see. All of this follows from the fantastic improbability of life having happened by accidents of any kind. All of it declares God's presence and involvement in our world, breaking the silence, shouting to anyone who has ears to hear. And as if that were not witness enough, there is more. And with that tantalizing thought, I'm going to leave because that's the end of the chapter, and we'll discuss the last two chapters next week. Now my take on that, I think here Acts points out that there are religious or if you prefer anti-religious reasons for denying ID a place at the conversation. They're afraid it's going to win. And that the strategy is to avoid dealing with the scientific evidence rather than confidently showing in detail why evolution is right. Because they know they can't explain it. They, in their better moments, admit as much. This flows from the lack of evidence for evolution being able to do the creative work usually attributed to it. And that includes natural selection, and that includes random mutations. I think Axe is right. The retreat into invoking past processes that no longer exist in the present, and to multiple universes to overcome the extremely low probability that random variations, including random mutations, can account for the variations we see, is basically a retreat from real science. This is, in fact, science versus religion, or anti-religion if you prefer, but with the roles reversed from what is usually claimed. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. We have a couple of roving microphones for those of you who haven't been here before. We have a few. Sure. And so, uh, you know, you raise your hand and you'll get a chance to, to speak. Uh, Ariel. <laughs> well, um, uh, I can totally agree with this chapter. I mean, this is a great presentation of this ID that has drifted into the scientific community that they're rational and they're not a religion. Your conclusion that uh, the roles have been reversed is very correct. We call this class faith in science. And uh, most people interpret that, well, faith, that's Bible, believing in, 
and God and so on. And uh, science is a study of uh, nature. Uh, really, uh, what acts uh, has opened the door to and what you suggest is that the faith part of this is scientific speculation and the evidence for a designer is the science part of this class. Uh, interesting reversal of the situation, but I think that it is closer to reality. What I find fascinating with this whole thing is, you know, earlier in some of the other earlier chapters, he says things like natural selection can't create. And he says that, you know, the, the just, <coughs> it's hopelessly sheer improbability for getting these things to organize themselves. You know, he, is that this? Let's see if that, no. Try it there. Let's see if that met. What? Um, actually, I do, but uh, that has never bothered it before. <laughs> Let's uh, just uh, see if we can. Well, if it'll uh, there. Well, that was supposed to work. One more time here. It tries to go down. Uh, let's try it this way. Uh, now you've got no more excuse, so <laughs> behave yourself. Uh, what I find um, somewhat tragic, however, is that the scientific community has formed a block to tell the masses that they are right. So therefore, the masses have come to believe that evolution is the only explanation. And uh, my neighbor, as an example, uh, who didn't want to send her child to um, public school, wanted a better school, sent her to, school to, a, sent him to a school that was faith-based. Unfortunately, they began teaching her son creationism. She came over, she was so upset that this school was not teaching what science has proved. And um, why can't they admit it to the masses so that masses don't, <laughs> don't get hornswoggled so badly? Uh, you know, that's, a, that's an interesting question. And, and the thing I find fascinating about that is that uh, if, you, if you think about it really carefully, the masses are by and large not fooled. On every survey that has been done for I don't know how long, approximately 40 to 45 percent, the number varies with the time, um, of people in the United States will say that uh, humans uh, came about about 10,000 years ago uh, and that God had something to do with the process. But interestingly enough, about 35% will say that humans came about millions of years ago and that God had something to do with the process. And it you know, depends on the numbers, and I guess they're now starting to raise just a little bit. But even now, it's only about 15% of people that will say that humans arise, uh, arose millions of years ago and God had nothing to do with the process. So what is being taught is a very distinct minority of what is believed. Remember, Douglas Axe would fall in the second group, I think. Um, but, uh, but this is not actually, to be precise, this is not the masses. This is actually the uh, 
this is actually being pushed by uh, a distinct minority, but interestingly enough, a minority that has probably the vast majority of uh, people in the news media, uh, people in politics, uh, and people in, uh, in the entertainment industry. And so you're at not actually seeing, a, uh, you're at not actually seeing a minority that's being oppressed by a majority. You're actually seeing the majority that's being oppressed. Yes, my, my neighbor particularly is a very good Christian, actually. But she believes that the whole evolutionary process from the beginning has been directed by God. Mm -hmm. So she believes in God, but she believes totally in the evolutionary process. Yeah, and that evolution didn't need any assistance from God. <laughs> well, because that's what we're all been taught. Uh, I mean... I grew up in church schools, and so I haven't seen it myself, but I can tell you that uh, I certainly got exposed to it every time I go to a museum, you see that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. We have a couple of comments here, and then uh, Wesley. Yes, I've, Jan. I've spoken before of, of my 9- and 10-year-old fourth grade students, and each year I have probably at least three or four whose parents have put... Um, their children in a church school because they want them in a private school. Um, but they don't realize what all comes with that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> some do. We try to make that clear <laughs> that there will be, um, that this is a Bible-based school. Right now I have um, three who come from non-Christian homes. I have a Chinese girl who has never had any exposure at all to, to God or the Bible. And... Um, because I, I do a, a nine-year-old version of from Genesis to Revelation through the school year. Um, when I look at her, she's she has an expression of 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 this, but I'm hoping, as I've learned from from you and from this book, that her child intuition is going to to rise to the surface, and. Um, one thing that I think has been helpful in my last few years of teaching has been to say, both require faith. No one was there. No one was at the beginning except God. So um, really, uh, if you're going to believe in evolution, and I've had some Seventh-day Adventist children, not many, but a few whose parents a little on a different on a different circuit, different path, uh, will come to me privately and say something about, well, everything I've seen on TV is really about evolution and and the concept of mutations and natural selection and so on. Nine-year-olds that will come and tell tell me this. Um, I I think it's a powerful thing to say, both require faith. And that evolution is a type of religion. I don't know if you've said that before. Have you? I, I that have. evolution is a religion. Yeah. Or well, that's, that's the conclusion we're coming to at the end, is that evolution is a religion. And right now, evolution is fighting against the facts. Now, creationists have some difficulties. I have been blessed to find out that as time goes on, those difficulties seem to be receding somewhat. And my personal research into carbon-14 has reinforced that. But, uh, uh, you know, I wouldn't pretend that we have all the answers. Um, and, we're, and, and sometimes, Sometimes some of the answers are so big we can't even conceive of them yet. And I'm just running into people who are talking about crazy things like plasma discharges, um, creating uh, super heavy elements and then they disintegrating into um, elements somewhat similar to what we have on Earth. And they're talking about experiments that show this. 
really bizarre. Uh, sometimes we're just not thinking big enough. But, uh, uh, but even if we accept that as a, as a possibility, uh, we still may not be thinking big enough. You don't know. But the point is that the evolutionists have their own problems. As you can clearly see, they don't really have a good explanation. That's by their own confession. Natural selection can only select between possibilities that are already there. And random mutations are searching through a search space that is unbelievably large. You know, to where the number of zeros you put behind them has to be put in powers of 10. 10 to the 10 to the some number. It, it, you know, we talk about, I mean, he talks about in, in, in some cases pages where, where, the, where the, in order to write the 10 to that number, you have to print a whole book full of zeros. And in trying to uh, search through that, when there are only 10 to the 81 particles in the universe and 10 to the 25 seconds uh, in the supposed age of the universe and 10 to the uh, uh, 43 Planck times per second, you get 10 to the 150 and there aren't that many individual things that have happened in the universe since it began by the most liberal standards. Once you get beyond 10 to 150, you can't even flip coins enough to get there. And we're talking about not 10 to the 150, we're talking 10 to the 400, 10 to the 800, 10 to the uh, you know, millions and millions. You can't get there from here. There's not enough time to look in all the places. There's not enough time to look in a tiny fraction of the places. Uh, oh, actually, we had Wesley, and I should give him the time. Okay, go ahead, and then and then him. He's he's giving you first try. Uh, I'm just going to comment. Uh, on the question of faith, both require faith, and I agree to that. If you're speaking of blind faith, uh, there's faith that is based on evidence, and that's uh, different than faith where you don't have any evidence. Uh, I think it requires a lot more blind faith on the basis of our scientific data to believe in evolution than to believe in creation. Oh yeah, I agree. Uh, and that's why you see the evolution-creation mixes being so popular is because that way you don't have to have blind faith in one and you don't have to even have faith in the other. You just kind of uh, mix and match to, to fit whatever. Although it, se it still seems to me like it, if the underlying purpose of this is to get rid of a designer, then what difference, uh, how do you, once you've got a designer, oh, so many things come with it that you might as well, uh, you might as well almost quit and, and go full bore designer. I mean, why believe, for example, that the designer is restricted to tweaking conditions at, and, and tweaking laws at the very beginning of the Big Bang and never can touch anything ever, ever since. Uh, but, it's a compromise, but, is what it is. Yeah. But, but that, there's a, a deeper, and Axe refers to this a little bit, there's a deeper sociological factor here that uh, we need to take into account in this thing. Uh, I've mentioned this before here that about two years ago a Pew Research study showed that 51% of scientists 
believed in either a god or a designer. But the, the scientific community tends to be adamant about the fact that there isn't one. In other words, the, this does not reflect the belief of the scientists as a whole. It, uh, well, if it's gotten that bad, no wonder they're terrified. Uh, you, know, you know, I mean, uh, 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 you read people like Barbara Forrest and she comes off as paranoid. At least the beliefs do. But why, do, why does this perception, uh, tri tribalism has set in with the scientific leaders and they have the power to kind of keep the idea of God out of the picture. Because if there was ever a fully democratic vote, that kind of science would fall too. I, I think it's going to fall. I really do. I don't think that this is going to continue for too much longer. <clears throat> I, I think that what will rise afterwards will be a God that uh, takes a long time and that doesn't necessarily uh, follow the biblical story, but mm -hmm. I, I really don't, I don't think that the full bore atheist view is going <coughs> to maintain it. If, oh. if it's already gotten to 50% of people believe in God or an intelligent designer, then it's just a matter Sorry. of time before the leaders catch up. Yeah, well. And, and the leaders who are there <coughs> realize that they're standing on quicksand. I suspect eventually it'll move in the direction there is some kind of God, uh, but a recent creation by God in six days and uh, memorial of the, S the Sabbath and memorial of that, uh, that may be where the real issue will develop. Not that there is a God, there isn't a God, but the time issue, how long was there a worldwide flood uh, and so on is our geological story recent or is it old age and uh, of course uh, there are a lot of data that challenges the old age and there is data that challenges the recent uh, but there's sufficient data there that you can believe what the biblical story and then behind you the have chosen to give this series of presentations based on Douglas Axe's book. And I've just got to say that um, I believe, and I think anyone who's ever tried to write anything, which includes all of us, from writing essays in the eighth grade to postdoctoral presentations, have to be impressed with how clearly he states that. His sentences are lucid, they're well constructed, and the overall timing of the presentation of the sentences in one order in organization is, um, I think, about the best I've ever heard for the purpose. And, and just remember, what you've heard here is not actually the full book. I condensed it a little. Uh, I have his e-book because I wanted to read it myself, and uh, quite a bit of it. Is, what he does say is quite remarkable. One thing he pointed out that I want to comment on today really doesn't have anything with DNA or quantum physics, but he pointed out that the most devastating uh, argument against evolution on a very scientific basis have been presented by the most prestigious scientists, and they're allowed to present it they're allowed to publish it. Why? Because their overall theme seems to be, but materialism is true. And now, in spite of what we've just presented, and now I'm going to present a theory that brings it all together and proves it. And that reminds me, which is otherwise totally irrelevant, only interesting, of, uh, of what we've seen going on before our very eyes on television every night, if you watch, especially on Fox, is how in the primaries, candidates can say the most awful things about each other. Hillary has said some really very damaging things about Obama in the primaries that eventuated in 
Obama being nominated and, of course, then elected. But now that's okay because the overriding, the overriding uh, philosophy is that uh, Obama should be elected. So it really doesn't matter in retrospect how awful the things were that were said about him in the first place. But if somebody else were to say that, they would be, it wouldn't make it on Facebook. Yeah. It would be censored right off. So it really is interesting how... Well, you just have the same thing in the Republican side. If you look at, you know, com uh, Rubio's comments about Trump, Trump's comments about Rubio. Exactly. And, and now Rubio has endorsed Trump. I mean, it's exactly. <laughs> Very well put. So it's, it's really rather fortunate that we have... have uh, secular scientists who can be so forthright even if they have to cover it up, cover it up by and disguise it and excuse what they say they've said it and that's what we hear comment behind you my concern is that the not that the debate will be won scientifically I think the debate will be won by the numbing of the masses to the ability to critically think and, it, and simply accept what they're told. I did an experiment years ago. Whenever Waco was going down, I can't remember what year that was, but when it was on the news every night, I asked patients what they thought of it. Didn't say anything about it myself, just said, what did you think? And there was a definite age category breakdown on the response to that question. And what was surprising to me, it was just the flip of what I expected. And the younger they were, particularly pre or post Vietnam, the more willing they were to say, the, the government's right, they ought to just wipe them out. So the ability to critically think worries me in our society so that you don't have to prove your point. You need to simply need to entertain the masses enough not to pay attention, the games in Rome. And then it serves your point. And then it serves your point. And that worries me more than the scientific debate. They're gonna lose the scientific debate. I don't think there's any question about that on an intellectual basis. They may win, I fear, though, the society debate because no one will care or be able to think it through. Um, when you, we were talking about that they'll have to capitulate and acknowledge existence of some kind of God, immediately that came to my mind was pantheism. I wonder how that might play in, because that, well, that could the, the be... The nice uh, thing would be to have a God, and that gets rid of all that difficulty, but a God who won't interfere yeah. in what you want to do. And this, is, he's, this pantheistic idea is nebulous enough to, you know, you can kind of manipulate it in, like they're doing with evolution. It's plastic enough, yeah. you can fit yeah. it in anywhere. Yeah. And I think that what that means is that we have to, while we are, I think, uh, working with people like Douglas Axe, we have to prepare for the next phase. And one of the, one of the next phase arguments is going to be, well, yeah, he did it, but it took a long time. And that's why we, ha we have to be prepared for that. Because I think that's, uh, you, you know, you look down the pike, and that's what's coming next. It was sort of like if you wanted to call, you know, World War II, uh, the United States, among other nations, fought the, uh, the Nazis. But you need to look down ahead, further down the pike and say, well, if the Nazis <coughs> are gone, you know, does that finish off all our enemies? Not really. They're still the communists. You know? And, um, <coughs> I, I think that the fight is an entirely different uh, kind of fight because for one thing, I think uh, for good secular and for good um, religious reasons, we have no business resurrecting the, uh, the methods of the Middle Ages, you know. We, we should not be doing heresy trials, we should not be doing burning at the stake. Um, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, 
if I recall correctly, the founder of our religion said that uh, we're to love our enemies and to do good to those that despitefully use us and persecute us, which somehow burning at the stake doesn't really fit that description very well. Um, and, and so I, I, think that, uh, I think that we have to be really careful about how we do it. But I think that we should be looking down the road as to what happens when, uh, um, when pure atheism falls, as I think it will eventually. And we have to be ready for the next phase, because I think it will come. Uh, to Historically, um, the minority has been more noisy. Even though there are more people, scientists, who believe in creation, but uh, the ones in minority, that the ones who make more noise. Um, we talk about theories. Well, evolution is a theory. Creation, uh, we have so much of evidence, but we want to call it a theory. That's OK. Um, interestingly, um, the Pope. Uh, does not believe in creation, interesting. But he wants Dies Dios, the day of the Lord. I think that's how it's pronounced. But um, yeah. one side, one theory, evolution, is uh, state-sponsored uh, belief, um, whereas creation is not. Um, and. Uh, I was going to make another comment. Uh, one of the preachers in this country, the, perhaps the most famous preacher, believes in theistic evolution. Uh, and so what do all the others do who believe that he is a man of God? Who's that? Uh, Who's that? Billy Graham. Oh. Um, one last comment. 1.6 billion people in this world adhere to a religion who believe that this world was created in six days, world with everything, and uh, their book of faith is filled with Sabbath. Uh, they practice going to their place of uh, worship on Friday because when it came to the religion came to its being, uh, people who are going to the market on Friday, so they would all gather together. It was their tradition. They talk about what has happened throughout the week, and as well, since we're together, let's worship on this day. But it's really not uh, in their book of religion. Their book of religion clearly teaches Sabbath. So I believe observance. I believe a day is coming when all of this is going to be clear, black and white. That whole group of these folk are going to be believing and practicing and worshiping on the day that the Lord wants us to. I think that's why the, the whole world is being polarized into that. And the time is not going to be, I think it's quick, it's going to be fairly quickly, yeah, considering what's happening in, the, in this country's political system. Open water, really? Well. I was just going to say, uh, when the issue comes to, to the question of time, uh, you need to keep in mind that there is fairly compelling scientific data that it's not millions and billions of years out there. Including that are rates of erosion that are way too fast, residual carbon-14, uh, Soft tissue and dinosaur bones, uh, uh, genetic entropy. The, the uh, uh, idea, the recentness of man, uh, as it appears. I mean, in terms of quantity and so on. That it's, uh, all the good relics of man are very recent. Doesn't fit with the uh, long geological ages and so on. It's, I'm speaking of pyramids and. Uh, uh, other uh, ancient uh, good evidence, language, history, and so on, all seems to be fairly recent. Uh, 
we're not without significant evidence. I think that most of us are in agreement that intelligent design is so much easier to believe. My question is, how does intelligence, intelligent design deal with predatory species from the highest down to almost molecular level? There are predators who, who eat up other things. How, how did an intelligent designer work through this situation? Well, uh, the truth of the matter is that uh, most of the time intelligent design doesn't deal very uh, thoroughly with that subject other than to say um, the fact of malevolent design does not uh, negate the fact of design. And I, I mean that's true. Tanks do not come out of uh, uh, out of swamps or volcanic uh, debris any more than uh, any more than uh, medicines to cure cancer do. You know uh, that the fact of the matter is that that the malevolence of the design doesn't disprove design. It, now, some people will just drop it at that. Uh, some people will say, well, God has his own plans and they're far beyond what we can understand. I personally feel it's easier to say, take it at face value, there must be more than one designer. <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the simplest, most rational way to deal with that, an, I think. An enemy has done this. Yes, uh, well, Jesus do, does seem to have approved of that particular uh, uh, answer. Uh, and, uh, you know, I kind of hold his uh, thoughts in fairly high regard. <laughs> what to me professing to be a Christian, you know. <laughs> um, but so, you know, for me, the, the argument is non sequitur. There is bad design, therefore there is no design. Come on, guys. Even the bad designer had to take what was there already right, from God. And, and believe me, in some cases it's very, very good design if you, if you adopt the principles. I mean, you know, some of those tanks are wonders of, of, of engineering. But they're meant to kill people. You know, um, and uh, and like I say, it doesn't happen by accident. You know, uh, what happens is what's really going on is that a lot of people who are in the non-design, and they'll tell you this right up front. They really will. I mean, I've had conversations where we're talking about. Well, what about trilobites and, you know, showing that there's no pre-trilobites and there's no intermediate trilobites and they just appear and then another whole genera, I mean, not, or maybe family or, or order appears. Totally different trilobite and there's no gradual, you know, uh, intermediate species that, uh, that could form a bridge. And all of a sudden I get this, well, your God is sure nice. He killed 120,000 in Thailand. Well, it wasn't 120,000 in Thailand. I mean, uh, that includes what happened in Sri Lanka and it includes what happened in Indonesia. And, but, you know, who's arguing that the, the point is the same? You know. Um, and you're going, what does that have to do with what trilobites are? Because these people need there to be no God because they don't like the design they see. Well, you know, in my opinion, tough break. You have to accept reality the way it comes to you. You can't make it up. You can't choose the reality you want to believe in. That's not what science is about. Uh, uh, what that means is now we're going to have to figure out 
who the designer or designers are and what plans they have and whether we want to cooperate with them. That's what it boils down to. Uh, and that's a whole different subject from, you know, is there a designer or not? Anyway, we comment over here. Um, Oh, okay, we'll give you that and then pass the mic back to... to uh, uh, okay, so uh, if anyone would like to get into a practical confrontation with an atheist or um, someone, a real hardcore evolutionist, I found a nest of them <clears throat> over at Market Night every week, uh, Thursday night in Redlands. And uh, you could, if you think it would be worth your time, I don't know if it is, but uh, it, it, it is an opportunity to speak frankly to... Uh, you know, real. There's a a booth of atheists over there, and uh, yeah. I, I take it you've been there once or twice. Yep. Do, what kinds of arguments do they have when you start winning? Uh, well, actually, I've avoided them personally. <laughs> <laughs> I've just noticed them there, and you know, occasionally you get a little word with them, uh, but. Well, what's 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 their big comeback when it looks like they're uh, they're having trouble with the the? Don't know. Sorry, I I don't know. You don't stick around well. No. Uh, I, I I mean I'm I'm actually quoting an email or not an email. It's a it's a blog site and somebody was going over. Uh, uh, you know, the atheists were making, it sounded like they were making hay until I pointed out, well, what about trilobites? And then they didn't have any answer. And then all of a sudden, they come up with this, uh, what is essentially a theodicy question. And that's what really is driving them. You know, I can't possibly be right because if I were, it would mean that God was mean. So he, he makes uh, the main tenet of natural selection, right? But uh, aren't there other mechanisms now that evolutionists are ascribing to new information so that also need to be addressed? Well, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the standard theory that's been around forever is random mutations create alleles that can be selected for or against. Most of them will be against, but there will be a few that will be for, and, and you know, the ones that work better get selected, and then the ones that work better than that get selected, and gradually the organism zeroes in on the target, so to speak, until when you get done with it, it looks just remarkably designed. That's the theory. Now, the question is, can it do that? Is life constructed in such a way that evolution can actually go from step to step. And uh, the short answer is no. The long answer, we're going to take you through some of the research that Douglas Axe has done that gives him the confidence to write this book. Because he's actually worked it out. Now, what, So what uh, philosophy is he coming from? Is he a religious guy, or do you know what, where? He, he's, uh, if you start using the word God in the middle of that, knowing that it's inflammatory to some people, then you have to be, uh, you have to be committed enough to be able to, to buy that. And yeah, I, he's, he's Christian, and he makes no, uh, well, he, he, I guess technically he makes an apology in the sense of, an explanation of why he believes that, but he makes no apology in the sense of, oh, I'm sorry, I really shouldn't believe this, but I do. It, it's more of a, yeah, I'm a Christian. You know, that's the way I see it, and here's why. So, uh, uh, you know, he talks about God. And he talks about God created, and he talks about God created us and everything else around. Time frame, if you were to pin him down, he's not a young earth creationist. Um, and because of that, 
if you're going to use it, you want to be never use it implying that he is, in fact, a young Earth creationist. So I don't think that's fair to him. I don't think that's fair to uh, what he's written, and I don't think it's fair to the people who read it who later on will find out, well, he actually doesn't believe in short age. But I do think it's fair to say that he makes some points very clearly that that make a belief in blind chance basically untenable. And I think he'd be happy for us to use his work in that way. As long as we don't put extra words in his mouth that he really doesn't believe. And furthermore, some of these people, if you talk to them privately, they, they think, uh, you know, it would be nice if you were right. I'm just not there yet. And I think that for some of those people, if you were to show them more of the evidences, and particularly if you show them as time goes on and even invite them into, hey, you can check this out yourself, come on, you know, see what you think, that, that some of those people are willing to say, you know, we didn't believe the scientists before. Maybe they're wrong here, too. Not we don't believe science, but the current scientific consensus is not necessarily scientific in the true sense of the word. Um, the question of predators have bothered me as well. <coughs> and we, I think it's in the revolution that in New Jerusalem, there's going to be lion laying down by the lamb, and uh, somewhere, at least there's a song. Um, it does act like God didn't actually intend that to be the first pass. Yeah, but you see, could it have happened after the sin came in and the earth was cursed? Well, I, were, I, there, were, I, there, were there Anopheles mosquitoes? Yeah, and I think that the, that the mosquitoes are a good argument that God didn't create everything specifically. Uh, they're not an infallible argument. Maybe God created mosquitoes because we otherwise wouldn't wear enough clothes. I don't know. <laughs> 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 but, but it wasn't part of the original plan. And I, I think it's entirely... A, a, it's easy to argue on that on that grounds uh, but I, I I think that I, I think that the easiest is to say some things are not what God would want but he gives some of his creatures power to do some modification of the creation he's made and just to give you some idea of how much a modification is um, a group of researchers put their names in the DNA of an organism in code. And in fact, there was a design inference that was used to show that Craig Venter and company actually created the organism they did. Because some people got hold of it sequenced the DNA and found in a place that doesn't code for anything specific Craig Venter written out in uh, uh, I'm trying to think of what the uh, it's uh, amino acid code you know uh, the 20 amino acids have been assigned letters to make it easier and so you know you'll read and, and there's a C, a C you know, and there's an R, and there's an A, and there's an I. Isoleucine is I, for what it's worth. And G, glutamic acid, and I think N is glutamine. Or this, you know, there's, so there's a whole code there, already pre-done, pre and he put his name in there. And he put the institute that he was at, and I think there were two other people who got their names in there, and there's some kind of quotation they put in. Just... Put it in. Oh, well, the organism lived. 
there, there's some DNA that really isn't that terribly important. And if that DNA ever gets clipped out, the organism will get along just fine without it. In fact, it'll probably get along just a little tiny bit better because it doesn't have to create all this garbage on it. What? Um, mycoplasma... Uh, a uh, cap a caprium or something like that. It's a, it's a goat mycoplasma that he, uh, he... Yeah, he actually got a different kind of mycoplasma, took out the DNA, and put this one in, and now it, now it behaves like the other one, except that it has his name in it. It would be interesting. You know, somebody should do a, a search and just see if made by Yahweh is, uh, <laughs> is in the DNA somewhere. Might we find you at market night next Thursday? <laughs> no. <laughs> unfortunately, I'm going to be in Berrien Springs. Oh, well, it'll be beautiful there. Yes. It's pretty this What's time happening? of year. Is there some kind of creation thing going on? Yeah. Uh, Faith and Science Council of the Adventist Church, so. See you next week.